actually moved tremendously quickly. A lot of poor women. One of the first things that happened is, of course, because they're working shifts, including weekend shifts, and, and we needed more staff, so more shifts than they'd ever worked before, all of a sudden the child care issue came up. Well, one of the things we found is that why not bring your kids to work? There were some rooms there, cafeterias, etc., and we got a couple of volunteers and we provided child care. And they thought to themselves, isn't this nice? How I wish I could normally bring my child with me and they could have child care there. Why don't companies provide child care? Why isn't that possible? So they started to think about what is possible. And, and it was sort of, you know, you work here for 20 years and it never occurred to you that in other countries, you know, there's child care centers right close to the workplace or in the workplace. And it's part of the, you know, right of, of the worker. Things like uh, uh, we got a lot of men who were craft workers on the telephone boards and women who had worked in the same building for 20 years had never been to other floors in the building. Let's see what my co-workers do, this whole idea of what other workers do. Uh, and then finally what, what I think happened is we started to think as whole people. One of the things that capitalism does to you is it puts you into different categories. You know, now I'm a producer, and then I'm a consumer. So what do I want as a producer? Well, I want to be really well paid, and I want you know good working conditions, etc. And you know, and what do I want as a consumer? Well, I want to pay the least amount. Of, uh, but you know, we got to start putting that person back together so that I'm producing things that you're consuming, and you're producing things that I'm consuming, and we're a whole person. And then we start to think very differently about ourselves, about the environment, about the community, and about what are our rights. The last point is that they, they develop a sense of entitlement. I know that's a, a word that's a little tricky, uh, but a sense that as citizens, as residents, as workers, that they had as much, I'll never forget, a reporter came around, and, and one of the things we did is we let reporters in. We, we walked with them just to make sure, you know, they're not always the sharpest knives in the drawer. We wanted to make sure they didn't trip over any of the equipment or do any damage to it. So we would follow the reporters. And I remember being with the reporter who, who spoke to this middle-aged woman who's sitting there uh, uh, doing some clerical work and he said, you know, don't, don't you feel ashamed that, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, you've, you've, you've taken over them? She says, well, what do you mean feel ashamed? She says, I'm providing some of the best service uh, that I have ever done. She says, and, you know, why isn't this? You know, who, who says this company is owned by these other folks? People in British Columbia have paid for this over and over and over again. We have a right to be here. We have as much a right to be here uh, as anyone. And this, you know, I am doing the job I always do, only I'm doing it under, you know, less strain, in a cooperative environment, providing better service. What's the problem? And you know, the reporter is like, uh, let me speak to someone else. And what happened also, just this point about workers. What happened is we actually let the reporters talk to anyone. And they kept saying, well, you know, no, you're going to steer us. They said, no, we're not going to steer you. You know, uh, go talk to anyone. And every worker they talked to was quite articulate about what they were doing, why they were doing it. They also, by the way, all became very interested in history. Sort of, has this ever happened before? Who's ever done this before? And uh, my favorite was a, a number of them who knew me as a historian came up to me and said, you know, Elaine, tell us, tell us about that strike uh, many, many years ago. And I said, what strike are you talking about? And they said, well, it's the one where, you know, uh, the men and the women separated somewhat. And they said, tell me, how did you hear about it? They said, oh, when I started work here, somebody told me about it. You know what they were talking about? 
They were talking about the general strike of 1919. This is 1981. Through oral culture, telephone workers talked about uh, so when you got a job at the phone work uh, phone company, eventually at some point you got told about well you know there were you know there were strikes before and you know the women were the last folks in etc. So so uh, some of the history that we're bringing back to life again with. Uh, these occupations. That history is important. Uh, Howard Zinn would tell us history is important, but it's not important to get lost in, to you know, go into archives and never come out. It's important because it reminds us about what is possible. It reminds us to dream the impossible and act upon it, as you know the French used to say in 1968. And it reminds us also that it can happen very, very fast. It's, we tell the story with a long tail because we saw how it built up. But when you're there, it just seems to happen very, very quickly. And uh, we saw that with Occupy movement. Who knew? Who knew? We were over two years of, uh, of, uh, into the Great Recession. And finally, some people decided to take some direct action in Wall Street and capture the imagination. Now, they weren't brand new. They couldn't help but also see Maybe not the Paris Commune, maybe not all of those things, but see workers in other countries, citizens in other countries, activists in other countries, taking direct action. Ultimately, I believe that whether it's labor, uh, or whether it's citizens, or whether it's residents, or whether it's immigrants, uh, taking direct action is a vital part of, of, of what politics is about. Last point I'd make again, it's my second last point, I'm counting, uh, is think about this sense of entitlement. Uh, uh, that one of the things that has been going on for the last 20 years as they attack the public sector, as they attack uh, uh, unions, as they attack all of us, it is to lower your expectations about not only what is possible, but what you can uh, expect. As, as a resident, as a citizen, as someone who lives here. And all great movements often start off, as I keep saying this, fairly conservatively. They just draw a line in the sand and they say, no more, no more. And then when they start to say no more, they start to say, well, wait a minute. How is it I've come to think that, you know, as a worker, I don't have a right to voice? Who says residual rights resi resist, uh, 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 rest with management? Who says I have no right to speak up? Who says I have no right uh, uh, to, to my own uh, uh, opinions? And they start off relatively conservative, but as people join together, as they get involved in action, they, they blossom brilliantly, so thank you. So, we've preached on, so how about folks here? Your stories about occupations, your ideas of... Well, you brought back a couple of memories, I think it was back in the early 1970s in France, a community called Lip, there was a watch factory, oh you know about that, yeah? yes? And the owner said that they couldn't um, make enough money or something like that, they were going to close it down, so the workers just took it over, and there was no union as far as I know, any outsiders doing it, they just started doing it themselves, and they started producing watches and selling it at a cheaper price than what the owners were doing before. Well, there, there, was, a, there was a union, but... It was a French union, so, you know, <laughs> French unions are very interesting. But, yeah, the Lip Factory was taken over by the workers, uh, and uh, for a long time it was, you know, the, uh, 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 you can imagine, because when you take over a factory, one of the problems is, sure, you can produce for a while, but now you've got to be able to buy the parts. You've got to, how do you pay people? How do you do, I, I mean, the easiest thing, 
is how do you oversee the work? That's easy, because the workers do the work, and so overseeing it is not usually a problem. But getting, uh, um, uh, working out a sales network, which they did with, you know, basically going places uh, to, uh, uh, you know, around the country, and in fact, internationally to sell the watches, and then uh, uh, getting in parts and getting in uh, uh, materials in order to, uh, to build the watches. I mean, another version also, even before that, was one of the reasons I was interested in this was, was in fact, workers controlling Yugoslavia, and uh, 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 which was, you know, uh, an experiment that uh, lasted many years, but uh, has since uh, uh, demised. Can I ask a question instead of sharing the story? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, in terms of, you know, unions and the workers' controls and do you have any suggestions for uh, workers in small towns, specifically workers in fast food joints in small towns? Because uh, some small towns are like the, you know, you have fast food joints that are sort of like the only shops around. Not really a lot of unions there and not a whole lot of entitlement. Say, you, you could do something that would work there that could potentially survive. Absolutely. The, uh, the, the union that often covers um, fast food and, and uh, uh, service, services, well, there's a, a couple of them. There's a hotel restaurant, but, you know, in, in my Canadian experience, it tended to be food and commercial workers which uh, uh, actually has organized, uh, Canadian auto workers in fact have organized uh, uh, some McDonald's and some other places. But I think one of the problems we have is, uh, uh, is that we tend to think, well here's a vulnerable group of workers, now let's try and find a union and persuade the union to go in and deal with those vulnerable workers. But the story Manny told you is the workers created the union. And that's actually the way the labor movement, sort of on a good day, works. That the workers actually, and, and the thing about fast food workers is they're young, uh, they're vulnerable because they're, you know, uh, uh, there's a, a big surplus of young people and prepared to do those jobs. And, uh, but the other thing is if you're working in that area, there's uh, you know, I hate to say it, but if you get fired, you can always get another one. You know, there's McDonald's, there's a and there's, you know. So one of the things is actually bringing first the workforce together on the basis of their interests. Uh, and so it really is starting to talk to those folks. And you don't actually need a union to do that, and in many ways, uh, uh, it's better if they do it themselves. Uh, and once they do, you'll find that, you know, as they start to create, first, uh, labor law actually protects you for uh, um, engaging in concerted activity. Uh, problem is that labor law protects you, but the employer sure as hell is going to move against you. Uh, um, uh, in those sorts of areas, you, you really do need to uh, create some attention. And uh, I, uh, I remember meeting with uh, some very young workers in, as it happened, food and commercial workers in Canada who'd been organizing. I mean, uh, uh, I thought, this has got to be the most bizarre, but they helped organize a number of hotels. And you know how they started? They started with lifeguards. Hmm. Lifeguards, for God's sake. You know, I thought, lifeguards? Well, they were all on a swimming team, and so they knew each other, and, you know, what sort of summer employment could they get? Well, they got jobs in hotels as lifeguards. And they saw how lousy they were paid, how rotten stuff was, uh, nonsense, favoritism, etc. And so they started to talk to each other. Then they started to talk to other people in the hotels. And, you know, they already had a network through being, you know, swimmers. And, uh, uh, and typically, they also had a bit of a sense of entitlement. They didn't go in there cap in hand. They went in there with a little bit of attitude. 
Uh, and so I think it's uh, uh, often people working in fast food uh, in small towns go to the same high school, they go to the same, you know, uh, what unions are about is finding folks who have things in common, linkages, and moving those linkages even stronger. They also have parents, and those, uh, uh, sometimes those parents might have some resources, sometimes you best don't want your parents to know what you're doing, but, you know, it's, uh, uh, and, What's so exciting about that type of organizing is that is what organizing is about. It's about finding a, a community of interest amongst folks and working on that basis. So. Matt, are you? Oh, I could, we got some organizers back there. I could just briefly respond uh, to that point. Um, uh, I think uh, the FCW is a checkered union, obviously, throughout North America. Uh, and has some very good locals and some that are highly corrupt. I know some of them. Uh, but this is what I would say. The, well, I know the good ones. You know the corrupt ones. So. Well, I actually know some good ones, too, uh, <laughs> up in Canada. Uh, but, but what I'd say is that, and there's some in the U.S. as well. There's a couple of people that are good. Yeah. In a small town, uh, a fast food, who are you going after? You're going after McDonald's, uh, uh, Stewart's, I don't know. A&W, I haven't seen one of those in around a, around a long time, but I haven't been on the road in a long time. Burger King, Wendy's. Burger King, Wendy's. What's the one? That, uh, Tim Hortons. The point is that you're, you're going after the major chain that's a multinational corporation. Um, what's happening in New York increasingly is that in the, uh, what they refer to the fast food, the quick uh, food uh, restaurants, uh, they actually are forming cooperatives. Uh, so you have a number of colors in New York City uh, is starting to pick up in its uh, ability to uh, get a clientele who cares about, in fact, uh, eating at a cooperatively run restaurant through uh, Rock United, which is now a nationwide chain of cooperatives and uh, effort to mobilize people through worker centers. Rock United is really more of a union in a certain way for those people who occupy positions at the lowest rungs of the, forgive the uh, analogy, the food chain of restaurant workers. You know, you have the white tablecloth restaurants, and then you have the interim uh, restaurants where you, uh, you know, pay a, mo a modest amount of money, but for some people it's a lot of money, and then you have people, you know, you pay three or four dollars and you get dinner, if you're lucky. Um, I think those might be the hardest to organize the ones that are actually part of multinational corporations. But increasingly in city after city, I bet you in Vermont, in Burlington, there's a rock uh, Vermont. Uh, and I know that there are many, you know, there's dozens throughout the country. And um, what they're trying to do is, you know, establish their own restaurants and uh, create conditions for workers who are getting paid very low wages, uh, typically not in the fast food area, which is the most difficult without question to organize. You know, the, the notion of the McJob is uh, hard to get out. And what Elaine said is absolutely correct, that uh, it, 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 you're really dealing with a segment of the labor market that's uh, highly mobile, and people don't really want those jobs necessarily, although if you paid me uh, $20 an hour to work at uh, McDonald's, I would certainly do it, you know depending on how many hours I'd have to do, you know, those are the kinds of, you know, if you pay somebody enough, it becomes a good job all of a sudden. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to debate the, the merits of organizing fast food um, as somebody who's organized in this community for a long time. I think that, you know, and I am at CIU, proud of it, don't have purple one, but, you know, I think the reality is, um, for labor, we look at where people can make changes in their lives, where they can have power, and can really change capital. And you cannot do that one McDonald's at a time. It is not a winning strategy. Um, it is part of a multinational corporation, and the experience I know of individually organizing McDonald's is it's a lot of um, not a good use of anybody's resources because it doesn't ultimately change anything and challenge challenge the power of McDonald's, and that's really the question, is how do we challenge capital? No. I wanted to throw out a question, because, um, I mean, I feel like to me the question is an interesting question, it's um, like, 
taking control of capitalist property and workers asserting, pa asserting power. And I actually had one sit-down strike that I was involved in. In 1974 in the auto industry in Chrysler, there was a series of wildcat strikes that were totally crushed. And the, the issue for the arbitrator to determine was who controlled capital and who controlled private property. And what happened was it was started, I just think it's an important little story, and much more contemporary. In 1974, there was a series of racist foreman in the auto industry in Chrysler in Detroit. I was a member of the UAW. And we had a series of wildcat strikes against those foremen. And one strike, one factory was taken over, uh, Chrysler Jefferson Avenue, and that was successful. And it gave range to another series of strikes. And we occupied the factories. And we had wildcat sit downs. And the first thing that happened was the UAW was asked to denounce those strikes because there's a no strike pledge and the union leadership, whatever my view of it was at the time, did what they would have been required to do and the workers were fired. And the debate was whether you actually have control over capital. And, you know, I feel like the issue for labor in this country is that, you know, the labor leadership, even when they're progressive, are called in to basically denounce it. And we all know that that's what happens. And is there enough strength in the rank and file? And, you know, I feel like, you know, workers will always get fired in those situations until there's a mass left movement and a big progressive movement of tons of labor solidarity. And workers, you know, just in one factory themselves are not going to change things. And I feel like to, to say that they can without a broad-based working class solidarity movement with lots of labor solidarity is kind of like, just to me, is not like, you know, is, is, is not going to, you know, change things. And I feel like, you know, for me, the question is, how do you, uh, I'm, I'm kind of jumping around, partly because I feel like you said a few, you know, a few things, but I feel like, you know, where the labor mu movement needs to think about is where do you really change things and where do you set standards for workers and how do you really, you know, change capital on it, whether it's by sit-down strike, whether it's by, you know, organizing, those are the questions and, you know, how do you, like, basically challenge capital. So I didn't mean to be all over, I just was kind of reacting to a few of the things you yeah, said. Yeah, let me, I think you may have misheard me or maybe we just fundamentally disagree on the McDonald's story. Because I started it by saying, don't go to a union and expect a union to help you organize that. But then I go one step further than you. I don't say to you, therefore you can't do it and, and goodbye and you know get a job, get a real job, Ken. I say, do organize McDonald. Don't call on the union. You organize it. And will you take the corporation down? Probably not. But what you will do is you will go through a very important experience that will set you hopefully on a life track because every one of us starts that way. I think going to uh, an organizing institute and then being, you know, it's like you start by, you learn to organize by organizing. And so it means that if you're working at McDonald's and it's the shits, you should talk to your fellow workers who also, who are probably your contemporaries, who also have some problems. Because that's how unions actually develop. They don't develop because folks who've got, I don't care what union, uh, you know, we have this illusion that unions are, you know, these folks with, you know, the, I think it, we're now saying it's 15 million folks and someone in another. There is another version. And that is that workers sort of do get together and, you know, start to talk to each other, take action in common, think about strategies, etc. Will you take down McDonald's? Probably not. But someday McDonald's will take, be taken down. And when it is, I think it's as likely to be taken by actions like this. If we were saying to, I mean, you know, all of us, if somebody came to us and said, I have a great idea. I'm going to get some of my friends and we're going to move to Wall Street and put up some signs and say, Occupy Wall Street. What do you think, Elaine? You think it will take off? Are you out of your fucking mind? I mean, what are you doing? You know, like, 
oh great, you know, like nobody's thought of that before, and who do you have behind you? What sort of media strategy do you have? And don't you know Wall Street's protected like Fort Knox? And nobody in the media, the corporate media is all bought. They're not going to cover it. And, you know, and we, we, would, we would shit on it, right? And, you know, but my tendency is to say, you know, go for it. We'll try it. And union organizing, we got to distinguish between, and you know this, between union organizing formally of, you know, the big institution with the resources that sits down and develops a strategy, and what is, you know, sort of workers getting together and, and starting to talk about their conditions, etc. even in places where they know that they're not going to take down the corporation, but you know, they might be able to have some voice over their shifts. They might be able to, even in corporate McDonald's, do those sorts of things. And when word starts to get out about those little sort of things, uh, uh, you know, that's how things happen. The arrow of time moves in one direction. It, uh, 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 and everybody looks back at, oh yeah, you know, it was very obvious at this point, they did this and it led to that, it led to that, it led to that. You write that when you look back. When you're creating change, you know, you're doing something that you think may not work or may not be significant, and it turns out to be significant. And I, I think maybe we agree at least at that level. On the level of, of thinking about how, because the issue for big labor, let's call it big labor, <clears throat> labor with resources and people and uh, staff and uh, stuff. That's a different story. And there, there I think we got to be a little less arrogant and not believe that, you know, that we got all the answers. That, you know, uh, I like to think that, you know, there's big labor and there's also small labor. And small labor is all sorts of organizing that working people do, some of which will hopefully result in unionization, some of which will result in voice in different ways, some of which will result in failure, but, uh, uh, but, but if you do it well, if you do it democratically, if you do it, uh, you know, it can be a learning experience and, and you might just make the world a little bit better. On the issue of, you know, how do we deal with big capital at, at this point? Again, I, I really do think that, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we're always dealing with the problem of, you know, I mean, the truth is the phone company owned the phone company. We took it over. We put signs up, said now 100% publicly owned, you know. Uh, you know, uh, and it was for like four or five days. No questions, the courts came down. Uh, no question. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, you can create space. And the best that I think in this period you can do is create some space and create some sense of what is possible. And I mean, quite frankly, a lot of, you know, the, the existing labor movement has done some of that. You know, organizing, whether it's, you know, for things where we disagree with SEIU, how about justice for janitors, it at least took a group of workers that nobody thought was possible to organize, develop the strategy, was able to organize and improve their lives. And that's great. Uh, and, but there's a lot of other places where, you know, we, we, sure, we do need strategies, but be careful to not think that, or to, to block out something radically different, totally different, that, that might not be exactly the way it came out of the 30s and the 60s, and, and, uh, uh, and you know, you were involved in occupations that lost, I was involved in occupations that won, by the way, after the phone workers did their occupation, we had a public employee union that also did an occupation. It was an unmitigated failure because, you know, what they did was, you know, say this, they took over some government offices and nobody noticed. Uh, I, I, I'm serious. They, they were not producing anything of, you know, of, of value that would particularly bother anybody. And, they, uh, uh, it, it wasn't noticed. But what did happen is other workers started to think about ways of building a coalition between the public and, uh, and their members. So they did things like, uh, and some of it was still a little bit illegal. Uh, bus drivers, 
letting, uh, deciding to not collect fares uh, in protest. That was stopped by the courts because that was viewed as theft. So then bus drivers started to show up in Halloween costumes. And if you've ever got on a bus driven by a pirate, you will appreciate you get a lot of attention for it. Uh, uh, and then uh, discovered a, a, a quirk in the law where uh, people started to use IOUs in place of fares. And, you know, sort of this whole game about challenging, you know. But much of it was built around how do you build a coalition with the public about the service? Uh, so I think this one is then you, James. I think you. No, I was going to ask about ownership as you know a problematic aspect of what you've been talking about. Uh, there's a wonderful example of organizing from below, going on with the Walmart workers right now, which is very encouraging. They're not unionized, but they're forming associations, which a lot of folks may know about, and they're getting those kinds of better working conditions. But ultimately, since I am a socialist, I do wonder about where does ownership come in, and I wonder how the cooperative movement, setting up co-ops, uh, uh, relates to the kind of sort of uh, worker control examples you've been bringing up. Yeah. If you have three hours to answer that. No, I, I can give a quick version. I, I used to not like cooperatives and you know ownership because I had all the really good socialist arguments that oh, these are small little things. Capitalism, you know, will crush you, etc. And then I started to realize how do you imagine the future? Do you really think that there will be this big revolution and then, you know, we'll seize the means of production and start running them differently? My experience is that you've got to actually try things. You've got to try. And so in many ways, things like co-ops, in many ways, things like worker ownership, experiments, uh, are really important as you start to, you know, the lip factory that you mentioned, all of a sudden, the stuff that's going on in Argentina right now, uh, you, start, yeah, you start to realize that, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, uh, here's a possibility. Here's the way things could be different. And so, uh, you know, will those uh, experiments be such that they transform all of society? In my opinion, no. But they transform some people to think about different possibilities. And they hold up hope. Uh, I know, for instance, with my phone workers, that just even running things for five days showed them that, you know, first that they really didn't need bosses, which was sort of, you know, I've always felt that way. But for a lot of folks, that was sort of really interesting. And that, you know, that it could be organized differently. They could participate in these decisions. All of those things. And that's one of the things.